I have a lot of really cool friends who do a lot of really cool things. I wanted to make it a goal to sit down with these friends and spend about 15 minutes or so getting to know them better and find out about their past, present, and their future. The result is this show. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is 15 Minutes With. Dave Marquez is a director, a producer, an all-around great guy. He's a very creative individual, and Dave, it's very good to have you here today. Thank you, Grant. I appreciate that. Well, you this is really, really cool. Uh, you produce and direct over 52 weeks of television a year, and that's just the, the wrestling that you produce, that's but right. you also direct for uh, the Orange County. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. I'm so uh, sorry. PBS. I, PBS, yes, yes. PBS. <laughs> Um, but you just you do all this stuff. How do you find the time? That is my first question. Man, it's it's so difficult, uh, especially as getting older and you start thinking about well, do I do I want to you know the real family environment? Do do you you know where's what am I going to do in five years? But it, outside of that th- that main question, it's I just make time. I, I enjoy doing it. It's not like it's work uh, usually, even though it's an awful lot of work. Uh, producing and directing pro wrestling, and you're there, you know. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the the term herding cats, you know. That's exactly what we're doing. Hey, where's that guy? Where's this guy? Uh, does does he have his side? Does he have his lines? Um, uh, does he knows what he's doing? Because uh, we do change things on the spot, of course, based yeah. on the he's nature there. of the show too. Mm-hmm. Uh, something might happen in the first segment that's really going to affect the last segment, and it's like, oh, let's change this. It's it's very it's very improv, you know. Yeah. Uh, but how do I find the time? I just uh, I just make the time. I make sure that everything is there. So right now, uh, like you said, I produce and direct Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. I am the director of Inside OC, which is uh, PBS SoCal's uh, Orange County uh, Civic uh, uh, show. Uh, uh, because PBS SoCal, since KCET is no longer public television in Southern California, it is now KOCE, and so they're putting a lot of their resources into L.A., versus mm-hmm. Orange County, uh, so that's why this show has come about. Uh, I direct commercials and other TV shows and events and concerts and stuff throughout the year, um, and I, uh, well, what else is there? There's tons, but uh, what I do want to say is I consult for other pro wrestling companies across the country in getting their local uh, pro wrestling on television, so uh, every day, my day's pretty full. When did you get your interest in entertainment as a kid? Now, I know you draw. Was it yeah. through drawing? Is that how you got it? Or uh, how did it start? Uh, I it, Probably the earliest days growing up in Southern California, you're always surrounded by all of entertainment, of course. Uh, but I think the biggest influence that I had, it was kind of a tie and probably much like yours, too. It was uh, seeing Walt Disney and reruns on television. Um, from my earliest television memories, which could be two or three years old, mm-hmm. uh, and Jim Henson, uh, and probably Sesame Street, The Muppet Show, uh, but realizing early on that uh, this, somebody made this, that this was all manufactured. Here locally, I know that you had uh, those puppets up north on television. Yeah, Charlie and Humphrey. That's right. Pat McCormick. So down here, we had Tom Hatton in Los Angeles, and Tom Hatton, he hosted the weekend uh, family film festival on KTLA, but he also was the morning sh- uh, kid show guy, so he hosted the Popeye show. Mm-hmm. But he did something unique. He had the spinach can, and he uh, encouraged kids to send in just just what he called squiggles, which could be anything. And he would then turn your squiggle if you were selected out of the, the spinach can uh, during the course of the break explaining what cartoon was coming up next. He'd see your drawing, and let's just say it's a spiral, and he would make that spiral into uh, uh, Alice the Goon or something. Mm-hmm. And so, and like, and then now we're going to see some, uh, Popeye S. in Bad the Sailor. And, but he, he was on TV for like three hours every morning. So I'd sit there, and I'd watch him, and I'd draw with him. And then I realized that it was like, hey, this is this is not just entertainment. This is, I can do this. Yeah. And so that's really, I think, what Walt Disney showing, you know, the animate, animate, all those those great shows that he had on TV. Jim Henson kind of exposing even more of himself, as you know, you know, to him they were just puppets. And, but, and actually opening the curtain up and seeing those specials and things, especially when the features were coming out. And uh, and Tom Hatton, those are like three big influences when I was a kid. And what was what's like sort of the first creative thing, uh, you know, when you were younger that you really threw yourself into, you know, the, either 
You know, for me, it was like kind of putting on shows for the family. But what? What was? How about for you? Well, my family still to this day doesn't get what I do. So um, <laughs> it's uh, probably drawing and flip mm-hmm. books, um, uh, puppetry, sock puppets by myself. Because mm-hmm. you know, don't you dare say you're going to play with a puppet or, <laughs> or ask for a sewing kit or anything like that back then. Yeah. Um, so probably that uh and voices because you were you could sit in your room or in your head you know and and as much when we were kids you know mel blank was on every channel probably between two o'clock and five o'clock you could hear mel blank's voice on a series of cartoons or Daz butler and you could in and once you know who they are and what the, and between toucan sam and uh fritos commercials and and all that and then when you, if you're uh, if you can hear it well enough and recognize it, you go to Disneyland. It's like, oh, that's Tony the Tiger, and that's, oh, and that's t- uh, you know, that's this guy, that's that guy, and then you figure out who Paul Frees is and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that guy's on Bowwinkle, you know. Yeah. So I I want to say probably voices, uh, flip books and uh, sock puppets. Now, and I know before the uh, current booming vinyl industry oh yeah uh you you i mean as for as long as i known you you were buying records and stuff did that start as a kid as well oh, like for the sure music? for sure well that's what we had of course right so and i grew up with my grandparents in their house so that my whole family we all lived together um and so he had my grandfather had tons of albums from all everything and then we're he, he's puerto rican so i had the influence of afro-cuban jazz and and not just salsa, you know. He would say, "You eat salsa," you know. This is <laughs> <laughs> this is not that. Yeah. Uh, and and so when it came to music, the house was full of symphonic music and all this stuff. And my grandparents are from Puerto Rico to New York to Los Angeles, so it's uh, I had all those influences in the house, and I'm so happy that I did. Yeah. And uh, so you know, you mentioned Walt Disney, and of course, you like me worked at Disneyland. That's right. What did you go to Disneyland a lot as a as a youngster? No, not at all. You know, back then going to Disneyland was uh, was a big treat, and I think anyone our age in our forties will tell you the same thing. Mm-hmm. It was expensive even then, uh, but I think I would go maybe every other year or every third year for my birthday, uh, which was in July. Which of course in <laughs> Southern California you'd never want to go to Disneyland in July, um, or maybe at Christmas or the holidays, maybe, mm-hmm. and then. You know, prior to the mid '80s, you'd still have to pay admission and buy ticket books. So when I would go, we wouldn't necessarily get to experience all the attractions. We can get on all the free stuff. We would buy maybe a ticket book, uh, and it was only my sister and I back then. I had since four four siblings, um, but for the longest time, it was just my sister and myself, my mom and dad. And uh, so one ticket book had to last like between the four of us. But back then, I want to say thirteen or fifteen dollars the admission. Mm-hmm. Which was enough for me because I, you know, you the parades and shows and the art and the architecture and all that. That was what I cared about. Um, but uh, I did not go a lot as a kid. I want to say when I got a car, uh, when I was sixteen, that was when I started making more frequent trips down to Disneyland, um, and uh, decided that I probably should work here. Mm-hmm. Type of a thing. It's like, well, I want to be here so and see how this place operates. And I had always heard that if you wanted to work for Disney, uh, it's a good place to be, and then they always promote from within, as you know, mm-hmm. uh, even up into the studio or other corporate areas, so that was the original thing, and so that I first got hired at Disneyland in uh, 1989, uh, right, at, right at about the end of high school, mm-hmm. so... So yeah. what, what were you doing first when you first got hired? Uh, tour, guide. tour guide. That's all I ever oh, that's, did. Oh, that's all, that's all I ever yeah. did. I was a, a guest relations cast member, and then I left and went into television in the Midwest and pro wrestling and all this stuff, and then uh, all that stuff dried up in the 90s. I came back to L.A. in 1999, uh, came home. Um, I had already worked in television. I might be skipping ahead of your questions. I'm sorry if I am. Uh, but, uh, you know, Terry Taylor, uh, who was producing uh, WCW and WWF at the time, back and forth, suggested I come back here and work for a guy named Rick Bassman in Ultimate Pro Wrestling, and so I was dabbling back in, in wrestling here, uh, even though I skipped a whole lot of wrestling history during that decade. Uh, and then I was like, well, I need a real job because wrestling doesn't pay. And um, I went back to Disneyland and back to guest relations. What, how did you get into, um, backing up just a little bit, but how did you get into producing television? Like how did well, that, how did that was start? Just, it was that was like the one when I was, you know, when video cameras became a little more available. 
Um, of course, I was shooting Super 8 stuff and playing with stop motion and uh, always breaking the advanced clicker thing and like, why isn't this working? And not understanding timing and all that. But once I figured out animation was that I was not going to be an animator, um, I guess it was just being young. I'm not sure but, uh, the patience and the time and that goes into it. Uh, I turned immediately towards video and uh, how that transition happened, I don't know. But like with most kids who are outside playing baseball or, or, or running around the streets all night, I wasn't. I sat at home and watched television and news specifically because I was so fascinated with how did that get into my house. And uh, again, anyone our age will understand that if you didn't have a fancy big giant antenna on your roof, you weren't getting channels. Mm-hmm. And so I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley here in Southern California, suburb of uh, Los Angeles, uh, La Puente to be exact. Now they call it the city of industry. Mm-hmm. Can't call it La Puente. You know, it's a little too too ethnic, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's in, a, it's in a valley. So it was kind of difficult to get TV coverage if you didn't have a giant antenna, which we didn't. So we had rabbit ears and our best of me touching my sister, touching the couch, touching, <laughs> you know, foil and all that stuff. Uh, we got television. So, yeah. uh, but watching the news... And specifically, uh, ABC programming in the late 70s and going into the mid-80s, that really struck a chord with me because I think they they really presented it a different way. And from Ernie Anderson being the voice of ABC to the programming to the gimmicky things they put on. And then you saw Eyewitness News. It wasn't just like it just wasn't like Channel 2 News. It had a name. It had a logo that other stations didn't have, a Circle 7. Like, all that stuff was going through my head even way back then. And then seeing how the show was put together and blocked from this Jerry Dunphy being the anchor and, like, they had the Eyewitness News team. And it was, like, really, ah, like, really pushed at you. And it made me want to watch all, back then, like, three hours of it before the network news came on, which I was also interested in. But but that's what really got me. I, I, I really didn't get into it because of, like other sitcoms or what other people are comedy it was really the local aspect of it It was oh i've stood there oh i've been there Mm -hmm. and now it's in my living room so that's what kind of attracted me to it and what was your first job in television production uh well right at high school right when i was a sophomore in high school uh they started an rop video class and uh, uh this lady her name was randa lee she's still around i haven't talked to her in years but her husband bob carroll uh, w- was the man who really taught the class. And he just kind of went down there, I guess, because the gear they used was his. And he was a uh, a gorilla-type uh, a video pr- engineer, and uh, he played in bands, and he was on The Tonight Show and all this stuff. Uh, and, and he had this infectious laugh, and he was the kindest man uh, for a bunch of kids. And I really took to him, and he really took to me too, because I think he saw that I wanted to uh, wanted to pursue this. And so being that kid in school that I wasn't, I was a horrible student, horrible, Uh, not because I, I, I couldn't learn. It was like, and I think most kid creative people are the same way. It was boring. Like, ugh, like really? Like we got to sit through this? Like American history was awesome because there were characters and there were situations, but like you go into algebra and like, oh man, really? We got to do this? So even art class was kind of boring me. I never passed an art class. Oh really? Never. A ceramics class, nothing, because I never did the assignment. Of course I can draw. Of course I can create perspective. <laughs> but, you know, draw the bowl of fruit. Well, mine had eyes. You know? Well, that, <laughs> yeah. wasn't, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the lesson. That wasn't the, what you were supposed to do. You fail. Yeah. Um, but it was Bob, Bob Carroll, and he had a company called American Video Phonics. And uh, he hired me right at – he saw – they taught me how to run a camera. They let me go and mess around. So my first job was a – paid job was a camera operator – on like high school football events, they had a show called uh, Inland Valley Sports Scene Magazine that ran on cable and on PBS out in San Bernardino area, and uh, that was my first gig, and it, it, sort of a pain gig too, but, but being with Bob was amazing. He passed away uh, four years ago, uh, yesterday in fact. He actually engineered the first uh, uh, two years of championship wrestling from Hollywood. I don't know. Right. Were you there for those? No, I, I, I don't think so. I think I, Actually, I think I came in. Uh, after the first year, okay. that's when I came. Well, in, Bob, but. if you remember him, big, big, giant Cheshire cat type smile, yeah. always brought equipment, white hair. <laughs> Anyhow, he passed away, and uh, uh, I wish he was still around to see what we did. The last thing he ever said to me, I was driving. This is when I was working at KDOC full time. 
Um, I remember driving down there and uh, driving to work one morning, and his wife, Diana, called me and said, you might want to talk to him. I said, okay, and he was bedridden, and a uh, very weak voice. He got on the phone, asked me how I was doing. Uh, very, usually being on the phone with Bob was hours, yeah. just about everything. And this was a very short call, and uh, he ended it with, it was like, I want to say less than three minutes. And I asked him how he was doing. He said he's seen better days. And uh, uh, I thanked him, of course, for helping me out. But the last thing he said to me was, uh, it was fun to watch you. And boy, did that lay me out on the five freeway. It was like, just yeah. opened me up. And he died, I want to say, hours later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and w- wrestling is mm-hmm. a huge part of your life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whether <laughs> whether I wanted to be bad, or not. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, when did, did you, were you always a fan as a kid of, of wrestling? You know, I w- I don't want to say, like, you were a fan fan. Like, yeah. you bought the toys and... And we're virtually the same age, so uh, I have a lot of friends like that. I got the toys too, but from a different for a different reason. I didn't sit there and stage in my room and like did my own. You didn't build ring steps like I did. Yeah, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't paint blood on my guys. You know, when there was blood and that kind of stuff. I just thought it was interesting to have the figures because they were very colorful and heavy. <laughs> yeah, uh, and none of my other toys were, but. I grew up watching wrestling because my family, my grandfather on my dad's side, he um, he sold, he, he was in the produce business, so he would go down to the Olympic Auditorium and sell <laughs> the bad fruit so they could chuck <laughs> them at the guys. Yeah. Now, I don't know, I've never asked Gene LaBelle this since, and he probably wouldn't know his brother Mike ran the promotion, but uh, I always wondered if they were in on it and why they let him out there in front of the Olympics selling this stuff. Uh but at any rate, I was always around it, and then I got involved through that door doing odd jobs, odd things, and going down to the Olympic and seeing how it was set up, and then noticing that it was television, and like, oh, there's a guy ringside, and oh, this is, oh, it's a show. Oh, mm-hmm. I got it. So that's the bug that kind of got me, and being attracted to guys uh, that were on television before the 1985, let's say, or 84, before the big expansion, you know, we had local wrestling here, uh, and then all of a sudden it became WWF Championship Wrestling overnight. Like, no, there's no internet, so we had no spoilers to tell us. Then I started seeing these different guys. So gone were the Guerreros, and Freddie Blassie wasn't a wrestler. He was a manager with the Iron Sheik, and it's like to me, it's like, what's that? Yeah, This guy is is an amazing guy, and now what, he's wearing a, a, a turban type thing on his head? Like, really? He's called Ayatollah Blassie? So, like, Freddie Blassie, seeing him on television and that type of personality being bigger than life, that's kind of what sucked me in. Roddy Piper, uh, all that kind of stuff. But then seeing the WWF progression and it going from, again, overnight without any announcement that the the, the, the wrestling show, the, the championship wrestling, which is what it was called at the time with Bruno San Martino and Vince McMahon and Jesse Ventura... That totally flipping overnight, virtually, if you remember yeah. up there, then it became this gigantic television, beautiful show like that. Yeah. And it became superstars of wrestling. It was like, wait a minute, what is this? <laughs> what happened to the little arena? And now there's lights and crane cameras and yeah. the microphone doesn't come out of the ceiling. Like, what? <laughs> what is all this stuff? Yeah. So seeing that show business piece uh, evolve is what kind of, got me more into wrestling but at the Olympics seeing that it was television and that the guy ringing the bell was the floor director and you know and that it, everyone was kind of working together to create the show that's what that's what got me into it now uh, as I mentioned before you championship wrestling the from Hollywood has been on for f- we're going on six years yes now and uh, you know that's 52 episodes a year that's if right. not more yeah uh, but what do you think uh, to you what is a compelling? What makes a compelling storyline that that in wrestling or anything? Because it's it's just like any other TV show. Sure. You got to get people to tune in. But what do you think makes a compelling storyline that'll make people want to watch? How I look at it is character. In our show, we have an awful lot of character, and I think that also goes back to my idea with animation or any type of character-driven design, puppetry, whatever. It's the character, the personality. Um, I think uh, even now with pro wrestling being as diluted as it is, and what I mean by that, if the people listening are not wrestling fans, 
is that back of the day of Abdul the Butcher and Bruiser Brody and these rough and tough, bleeding, like, you were afraid of these guys when you went to the show. Like, I don't know, and I know you went up at shows up there, like the Cow Palace and stuff, but, like, if you could remember going back to, like, the Andre the Giant, Big John Stud war, and then you saw John Stud come out, everyone would boo him, but they would totally take a step back. Right. Because they he just destroyed Andre the Giant with King Kong Bundy on television, and these guys are walking to the ring, and they were huge. They were yeah. big, big men. Today, unfortunately, uh, things have evolved, and the bigger men are not around, and so we have a lot of uh, smaller guys that... Uh, we had to learn how to present and make them bigger than life, and that's the character side of it. So uh, it's like the day of the cringing, uh, you know, Killer Khan walking to the street and he might uh, down to the ring and he might spit some mist on you, like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, that doesn't happen anymore. So that's why I really drive character, 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 and the wrestling moves and sets, from my point of view, come second because we have those segments to fill. And not everything that the guys are doing in the ring uh, uh, comes across properly on television uh, anymore. Before, you could whack a guy, and it was very believable because one was 6'6", the other guy was 6'4", they weighed 230, 240 pounds. But now you have, today, smaller guys trying to do the same thing, so the illusion kind of isn't there. So if their character is strong enough, the fan base, I believe, will be behind them because they like the character, they like the person, and the wrestling's cool, but as long as the story is told correctly and the good guy wins, you know, they, they kind of go for it. Yeah, but I, I think, and I've said this before about championship wrestling from Hollywood, that the reason I really like, I mean, if I wasn't involved, and I'm very uh, happy to be involved, and I, I feel fortunate to be involved, but if I wasn't, I would love watching it because I love sitting at ringside and the kids do get into it. Yes, well, and the kids, kids will always get into it. Yeah, and, and I'm you know, I've seen... You know, uh, Othello growl at a who's this big seven foot tall wrestler yeah. growl at a kid. And the kid goes scatter it. Yeah. You know, uh, and I I think that's what's really fun. You know, um, and and to to get to get into it. And I don't know if I mean you know, I know a lot of kids watch WWE, WWF, yeah. whatever. But uh, I really love the family friendly aspect of what you produce the show. You well, produce. thanks, and that's and that's the big piece. I want to make sure that that was uh, instilled in me through Gordon Soley, who. Uh, was a big time announcer in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, in the 90s, you might have seen him in WCW, like at their event center and stuff. But he was the the voice of pro wrestling for a very long time. And he was my business partner in Missouri with Harley Race. And they really instilled a lot in me about the presentation and the believability. And, uh, you know, just he, he, uh, they would say, you have to produce a show that mom, dad, the kids could come to. That, but also the clergy could show up to, something that you're not embarrassed for your grandmother to see. And those Midwestern tones mm-hmm. really sat with me. And again, I'm a guy from L.A. I'm from Southern California. And I don't think if I never went to the Midwest and stayed there as long as I did, I would probably be just like any other BMW driving goof on Southern California highways. It's. I really became a person, I think, because I moved to the Midwest and and were with these people, um, and uh, and learned properly about wrestling and and presentation and television and production and then you know even Walt has Midwestern tones and mm-hmm. all that. So I'm not saying be squeaky clean by any stretch of the imagination, but those basic values that you in theory should be following your folks taught you, uh, mind your p's and q's and all that. And if you can bring that into your product, I think that that's what makes it uh, <laughs> uh, edible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we do that. Yeah. So uh, thank you. It's uh, I'm glad someone noticed. <laughs> I definitely noticed, and I love it. <laughs> uh, so if, uh, we're going to wrap up here, but if people wanted to uh, find you online, where can they go to find out more about what you're working on? Uh, HollywoodWrestling.com is our website that is sort of updated. Uh, on Facebook, it's probably easier to find, it, find us at Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. On Twitter... Uh, it's at CWF Hollywood. Uh, my personal stuff, if anybody cares what record I'm listening to, because that's virtually all that I put up, uh, that's CWF Marquez, M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z. Uh, I'm David Marquez on Facebook, if anybody cares. Uh, but uh, I do a lot of goofy things in life, and I try to share that with everyone from 
just like last week as an experiment. I don't know if you saw, but I went and sat out in the middle of the street and just took photos at like six in the morning Mm -hmm. just because I wanted to see from (laughs) a social standpoint what people would say. And they said exactly what I thought they'd say. (laughs) Uh, But it was all plotted, (laughs) you know, to see what's what. But but that's me. And thanks for having me on. And we need to go to Disneyland. All right, let's go. We'll go right now. Okay. Big thanks to David Marquez for sitting down and talking to me today on the show. If you want to know more about championship wrestling from Hollywood, you can head on over to www.hollywoodwrestling.com or search Championship Wrestling from Hollywood on Facebook or at CWF Hollywood on Twitter. To follow Dave on Twitter, it's at CWF Marquez or search David Marquez on Facebook. 15 Minutes With on the Grantcast is a production of Saturday Morning Media and made possible in part by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to www.patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly donation for as little as a dollar a month. Huge thanks to Shea Stewart, Mer Lafferty, Jeff Peterson, Dale Gadania, Steven Staver, Jackie Klimo, Melissa Crawford, Chuck, Matthew Wayne Selznick, Dave Slusher, Mike Coughlin, Dorothy Bachoco, John D, Kathy Crawford, Brian Greer, Carrie Whitney, Chuck Tomasi, Chris Foster, Stephen Ng, Clinton of ComedyForecast.com, Vicky DeVries, and brand new patron, Mike Wabshaw. If you'd like to support the show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Saturday morning media, all one word, and set up your donation. Or tell a friend about the show, or leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back soon with another episode of The Grantcast. The Grantcast is copyright 2016 Saturday morning media, Grant Pachoco, executive producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com